Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Today, we're going to be uh, speaking to an amazing woman. Her name is Lisa Summers, and she um, gave the gift of life, and she's going to tell us all about it and and how she met her her husband, Dan, and made the choice. So, love is in the air. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Hi. Thank you for having me. So, so tell us a little bit about how you met Dan. Um, I met Dan on eHarmony, actually. Mm-hmm. And um, I had had kind of a hard um, love life. There was highs and lows, but um, at uh, 32, I was kind of like, okay, I need a better option on this because whatever I'm doing is not working. So <laughs> I went on eHarmony and they gave the matches because they do a personality test and they matched me with Dan and they actually reached out and said our compatibility level was extremely high and to really reach out to him more so than anybody else. And I did, and it went, it was just easy. And even to this day, we've never had a fight. Um, anytime we don't agree, it's very calm, and we just find our balance between the two disagreements. But it is actually very rare that we disagree on anything. So um, there was no push or pull in the relationship. It just naturally became what it needed to be. And so did you live in the same area, or was there a distance? We did. Um, we did. We were about, I would say, 15 minutes away from each other. So we were pretty close. And what was your first date? Um, we um, had talked online a lot beforehand of writing back emails, and he had a lot of questions. Um, and he took, um, invited me to Orange Hill Restaurant in Orange, in the city of Orange, in Orange mm-hmm. County. And um, I always wanted to go there, so I was really excited. Um, but I was also like not wanting to do another first date, <laughs> but I pushed through and um, we did brunch there on a Sunday. That you know what I hear so many people nowadays that meet people through online dating. I think it's more of the norm than than one suspects because <laughs> um, it's hard to meet people nowadays, and I'm so happy well, that yeah. And it's also like when you're really looking, like, do you want to go find somebody at a bar, and do you want to date somebody from work? What doesn't work out, or a neighbor, so it is kind of nice to go online, and I like eHarmony as to the fact that they they really did go by what we were into, what our personality was. Um, they found the things that I'm missing that I need more in my life, and vice versa for him, but also the things that we both agreed on or that we liked about ourselves we had in common, so um, it was probably the easiest of the dating sites. <laughs> so did Dan know he had kidney disease when you dated, or how did you actually learn about it? Um, so he just found out by um, a life insurance test that he did when he was 30. Um, we met, I think, when he was 36. <laughs> so um, he had known for six years. They found scarring on the kidney when he failed, failed the test, and um, he had gout. And I think he didn't know what it was at a young age. So when he had a flare-up, he thought it was a sprained ankle and then took a bunch of inseds to um, counteract the pain, which was the worst thing he could have done with the uric acid built up, scarring the kidney, and then putting in that. So um, it had caused damage that basically took about 40 to 60 years off of his kidneys. Wow. Um, he told me, actually, I think in the second email that he wrote to me, so before our first date, I knew that this was what it was. Uh, he knew that within uh, about 10 to 20 years that he was going to probably be on dialysis and need a kidney. And I had lost an ex-boyfriend who passed away. Um, so I had already accepted that at any moment somebody can just disappear um, oh, or wow. leave you. Um, so... I wasn't scared. I was more scared of sudden death, but I had accepted it. So this one, I actually was like, well, there's something you could actually do about it. So it's not a death sentence. It's actually just you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to fix it, and then you're okay. So when you met, was he on dialysis and needing a transplant at that time, or did you learn through the process of after dating that then he discovered, wow, I'm going to have to start dialysis and need a transplant? Um, he wasn't in full kidney. I think he was in stage four. 
Um, so they just were like, well, it's not like diabetes or lupus where your body's attacking it. You just need to be more cautious as to don't take NSAIDs, drink a lot of water, don't live off of broccoli and spinach, um, you know, those kinds of things. And if you have a gout attack, make sure you take your alpurinol and, you know, treat it. Um, so there wasn't any kind of um, restrictions when we were first together. Um, it wasn't until uh, our son was 18 months that we were married about a year and a half that um, he was starting to get the symptoms. And um, I think he was looking for other things. He was actually looking for jaundice, which would have been liver failure, um, <laughs> and the fluid retention. Um, so he was like, no, I don't have fluid retention. I'm still peeing. Like, uh, right. Those are the things. He's like, but why am I itchy? Why do I have leg cramps at night? Um, <laughs> why am I dizzy? Why am I tired all the time? And it was all the other symptoms. And so I would kind of Google search the other symptoms and be like, oh, you just need to eat a banana. That's why you have this. <laughs> and it would sound their kidney failure. But I was like, that won't come for another 10 years. And I didn't want it to be real. Right. Um, and then one day I just looked up all the symptoms together and it was like went down the line of this is kidney failure and the frequent urination, um, the not being able to sleep. Um, and I, we were laying in bed and we were watching TV, just our normal night routine. And I was reading it and I had to accept it. And I kind of cried quietly for a second. I wiped my face and I took a deep breath and I said, I'm so sorry that I have to tell you this but I'm going to tell you this and I need you to listen. And he went, okay. And I went through the reading of the steps and the symptoms. And I said, you're in kidney failure, honey. You need to go get your blood work done. And he was like, no, it's just maybe a flare up or blah, blah, blah. But if it makes you feel better, I'll go get it done. I don't have a lot of time. I'm really busy, but I'll, I'll make it happen. And I remember waiting for that appointment was like, I think it was like three weeks. And I was like, can you go now? The leg cramps are getting more frequent every oh, well. 10 minutes for waking up. You haven't slept. Um, and he's like, it's fine. It's fine. And when he went, I had all my orders of like, they're going to call me, be like, he's in kidney failure. They're going to start him on dialysis. Try to, cause I had gone through looking at what's going to happen. And, um, he left and they said, Oh, well, I'm not retaining water. They took the blood work. We'll find out what it is. And I read it that night and his creatinine was at a 23. Oh, wow. And, I knew then, I was like, you're in kidney failure, but why haven't they called? Um, the next morning while he was on his way to work, they called and said, what are you doing? He's like, I'm on my way to work. And they're like, well, uh, we don't know how you're walking or alive. We've never seen these levels. You should be in a coma. Um, you need to come straight to the emergency room and we need to check you in and you're starting dialysis. Do emergency so, dialysis, yeah. Yeah, wow. and so he called me up, and I think it was he choked up at the part of, like, I'm starting dialysis, this is happening. Um, so we didn't have anybody up here um, because, you know, we had moved from Orange County. So his parents flew in, and um, we I spent three days just battling going through the first dialysis and also knowing what to prepare for. I knew somebody that had gone through um, two kidney transplants. So she kind of gave me the breakdown of like, it's like cleaning a fish tank that you put off for a long time and the fish dies. The body is used to this and the first dialysis is the hardest when it's built up this bad. So these are the things, ask if he's dizzy over and over again every minute because it, your blood pressure drops fast and I need to put the medication. So it was a lot of that and um, I think he was just so overwhelmed by it and usually he's in charge. I just go with the flow. Um but it had to be me. And so it was an intense, it was an intense couple I can days only imagine, you know, I've had four transplants. So I know uh, those feelings. And when you you crash into emergency, um, um, I've heard oftentimes that after a couple of treatments, you actually feel a little better. I know I have because it gets some of the fluid off. and um, But it is, the dialysis is difficult. So when did you realize, um, or had you already researched, because you sound like a, a Googleite, <laughs> where, you, where you know where, you know you learn about things ahead of time, did you already consider that you were going to give a kidney, or did did the healthcare professional team tell you, or did you learn off um, of the I think on our second date, I told him, I'll give you a kidney, um, and, you know, he laughed it off, um, 
But to me, I've always been one that, like, if it's something I'm not using and somebody else could use it, like, why wouldn't you? And I've also known what it's like to lose somebody. And I know that I would rather have surgery and risk whatever it is than to lose my partner. And, um, Dan, obviously, we have a son. Um, I know how important it is to have two parents. You can do it with just one, but you want your kid to have the best outcome possible. And I wanted my son to know my husband. So it wasn't even a question. It was, if you're not going to do this because the testing is taking too long and I want this in him now, like, tell me how to cut it out of my body right now and put it in him. Like, <laughs> I'm, like I want this now. What was the process like for you uh, learning if you could donate a kidney? Uh, well, we wanted to because we wanted to have more kids. So we kind of were putting me off into the second round of people to be tested. So we knew right now we had 10 people come forward to willing to donate to him. Um, of the 10, five were actually viable to give a kidney once going through, have you had a surgery in a year? Have you had kidney stones? All those, your age, do you smoke? Those kinds of things kind of went through. And then um, the five were available. They would test three at a time. And we decided to put me in the second round because we would then have to put off having children for a year after the surgery. And it could make it so that I could go into preeclampsia, especially with my age. So we're like, okay, well, and he always planned on his friends. Um, but people weren't, it was like two months in and we weren't hearing anything back or um, knowing what was going on. And so we were, I was like, let's just take one person off, move me in and at least we can see where they should be at at on the process. Mm -hmm. Um, So we did that. And, um, you know, you learn that when people aren't seeing what's going on with dialysis and how much it takes out of somebody, um, it's not as an urgent thing because, you know, you have to pee in a container for 24 hours and that's kind of annoying. And um, you have to do the (laughs) glucose test, which means like, don't eat at this time, go in and, so the process is like, I'll do it next weekend. I'll do it next weekend. Right. And the meantime, convenient. you're not seeing what this other person is going through. Um, so people really didn't really get on it as fast. And once I got through the thing, they told me my blood pressure was a little high on the bottom. So they wanted to send me um, a blood pressure machine to wear for 24 hours. But it would take probably six weeks to get to me um, because they only had three machines. And that's the lineup. Um, so I think I called up his friend and said, where are you on the testing process? And he was like, oh, well, you know, I have to get to it. And I was like, I'm not here to put any pressure on you. If this is something you don't want to do, that is okay. Um, this is a big ask. It is a big thing. You have children. I get it. Um, but if you're not going to go forward with this testing, there's two other people that can get tested. And this isn't good for his body. He's putting strain on his heart. And if his heart gives out, then it's even harder to get him the kidney. So basically, you know, um, either you need to do this or tell us you're not. And if you're not, we'll, we'll be okay. But if you're going to say you are and don't move forward, that will be when we have a problem. Because somebody else could have helped and you're taking up a spot. So um, he basically was like, okay, I'm going to get on it. I'm sorry. And he did, but he didn't pass the blood pressure test. And by then, I had taken it, and I did pass. And um, his was due to family history. He was in shape, better than I was probably, but um, he had a family history of high blood pressure. So it wasn't going to go down. Um, mine was I rushed between getting my child and running down and drinking a bunch of coffee that day. And I should have been more relaxing before I took that blood pressure test the first time. <laughs> exactly. But, um if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have wanted to wear that machine for 24 hours. Um, but um, then it was like, okay, it's me. That's what's happening. So um, I had read another couple and they said it was one in 100,000 odds that they would be a match. Um, and I already knew I was O. So I knew I had blood type. I passed that first. It's looking at those antigens. So um, you are the universal I, donor. O negative. Is, are you O negative or O positive? O positive, which so, positive and negative doesn't matter for kidney donation. It matters for blood donation. They said the positive and negative didn't matter. It he could get he was A positive, so he'd get from an A or an O blood type. And then, so you you did the blood pressure test, then you went through all the tests. How how long was he on dialysis before you were able to donate your kidney? Um, December, 
beginning of December is when he started. I think it was like December 5th. And I donated my, we got the surgery on August 22nd. So. That's pretty quick, um, considering you weren't in the top of the list <laughs> um, making um, the, the kidney happen. That's pretty quick. Yes. Um, it was also, I wanted to go to UCSF um, because we're by Davis, closer to Davis, but UCSF has done the most transplants in the country. So um, I bought the insurance and said, no, that's where we're going. Um, my friend who had gone through two kidney transplants, she had a a cousin that had donated, she had tested to be a donor for her, didn't match, and said, you know what, I already went through it all. I'll give my kidney to somebody else. I don't know. I'll give it to a stranger. Um, and wow. she loved the process so much that she ended up donating part of her liver at UCSF. And oh so they love her, and she's an advocate. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. And um, my friend called and said, hey, do you know anybody at UCSF? Like, we need to get her on them on the list. Can they get them in? And she called somebody at the liver place, and they said, we'll do anything for you. They called up somebody at the they knew in the kidney area, and they they said, you know what, we actually have a cancellation, and they got us into our first appointment there in less than a month after starting dialysis, which is, like, unheard of. <laughs> um, and it moved us further. So um, it's all <laughs> it, was, it was all a fight. It was all a fight. Let's talk about the night before you're going in for the kidney transplant. You had gone through all the testing. Obviously, you're a, a person who can get things done. I mean, I can imagine the transplant team is like, oh, Lisa's calling. We got to get on our toes. Uh, <laughs> um, so the night of the transplant, you know, you're both going in for surgery. Um, what were your thoughts? And um, how did you handle the anxiety? Because you have a 18-month-old son at home. And... It must have been very frightening for both of you. Um, we had gotten our orders in check. We um, got a trust. We made up all of our plans beforehand of what would happen if he was to pass, if I was to pass, if both of us was to pass. Um, we did it all. And we both said that we needed to make a video for our son just in case of what we would want to say to him. Um, so I think that was hard. Mm -hmm. um, mine, of course, was like, an hour video and my husband's was like 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and, um, but I wasn't nervous. I was more nervous about going over the Bay bridge. I hated that bridge. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a scary one. To me, it was like, you know, um, the pain medication they give you beforehand is like the best buzz you'll ever have. And <laughs> I would go in first. So I was like, I'm just going to look forward to the buzz. And then once I'm in there, I'm not going to have any anxiety anyway, because now I have that fun buzz. And then um, once it's done, it's done, and I can't go back. And then it's just, it's like having the flu. You can get worried about having the flu, but once you have it, you're in it. And that's kind of how I looked at it. So my nervous part was actually more going over that bridge. <laughs> Well, and, you know, I, I have to agree with you about the pre-surgery meds. Um, you got to just let go to them, and it does help you, and instead of fighting it and trying to be more anxious. So uh, that's pretty um, uh, amazing that you understand that. <laughs> with How many surgeries have you had? <laughs> um, well, I had donated my eggs when I was uh, 22. Okay. Um, so um, I, I like to donate I guess, body. I know, it does appear that way. So you come out of surgery, and did you feel okay? I mean, because I think a lot of people who are listening may be thinking about donating a kidney, and I think a lot of people are worried about how much pain is involved, or um, did it leave you from being mobile for many weeks? Um, um, no, it was actually pretty easy. I remember waking up, and yeah, it's intense pain. Um they do, um, they did it laparoscopically. So, um, actually the most pain was the air. They fill you with CO2. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's actually that shoulder pain that's the worst because it presses on some nerves. Um, uh, but you do, you feel, I would say the most uncomfortableness that you like to compare it would be the worst you feel in a flu where you're like, Oh my gosh, I can't, I can't. Like, when is this over? Um, but I think I asked. Is Dan okay? Is Dan okay? Mm -hmm. And then um, they said he's still in surgery. 
And I said, okay, pain meds, pain meds. <laughs> and then they give you something and you knock out and then you wake up three hours later and I could see a clock in front of me and I'm like, is Jan okay? And they said, the kidney is working. Oh, I bet you, you just had this amazing sense of relief. I mean, just well, and then like... you're also groggy. <laughs> so, um, and I was like, okay, okay, it's, it's done. Like we're on the other side of that. And then I went pain meds, pain meds, and they knocked me out. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, finally you're not as bad. So they move you into another room and I was still on pain meds. So I was like, he should have the single room, give him the single room. And then I was like, I have a, I have a share a room. Why did I do that? Um, but <laughs> it was the best for him. Um, and then um, we could visit each other, but we have to be in different rooms uh, because I needed to be focused on my healing and not his healing. Right. So we could visit each other and walking um, is the best thing you can do. Um, you do feel that pain of getting up and thinking, how am I going to get out of bed? I got to be careful. You know, you're stiff. Um, and then you have your walker and we would, you have to get in 13 laps around at UCSF. They have... Um, uh, they call it, I forget, but it's this big hall that's circular. And if you do 13 laps, it equals a mile. So you have to do your 13 laps before you can leave. And so we wanted to get out. I would say we got out of bed the next day and, um, we had walkers and we're there. I'm 37, 38 uh, or no, I'm 37 and he's 40 and we have both walkers and we're walking around. I'm like, how did we get here this fast? Um, <laughs> But it was funny. We were laughing. Uh, we had jokes. We had our things. And, you know, you're careful. Um, and misery does love company. It is. There is something about, like, you understand where I'm at and you're not just complaining and somebody doesn't understand it. But do you feel this? Yeah, you have it. Um, and then I would say the second day was kind of bad. I learned that if I took um, a fourth of a milligram of Danex, it relaxed my muscles and that shoulder pain would go away. Um, ice on the shoulder constantly and heat were the incision and you didn't really feel any pain too badly. And also they give you sleeping pills. So you go to sleep with the pain meds that they give you that you slept through most of it. And I would say it was like, I'd sleep for four hours, wake up and it'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm feeling discomfort. And it wasn't as intense medication at the beginning, but I'd go to sleep again and I would stay for the next on the third, on the, Second day, I probably slept for the entire day mostly as I did that routine. And then I woke up at 2 a.m. on the third day, and it was like it was pretty much gone. I mean, if I didn't have Tylenol or um, a slight pain medication every four hours, I did feel that incision of inside that burning. It would get more intense. Uh, but Tylenol, two Tylenol would take it away for four hours. Um and it felt, if I moved the wrong way, it almost felt like running too fast, that side cramp. Um, but it only was for a second. You just go, oh, can't move that way. Relax a second. And it would go away. Um, uh, we were released the same day. So we went in for surgery on a Thursday evening. We were released Sunday um, midday. Wow. Um, we went home and we kind of healed together. And we just laid in bed and was like, don't make me laugh too hard and we'd be making jokes and um, it kind of was much better except for the incision pain. If I didn't have the pain medication, I would say that was completely gone by the first uh, probably like a week and a half after the surgery mm -hmm. and then everything was normal. And when were you able to like get back to normal activities of like picking up your son and doing different things that you normally do? So I had to be careful for six weeks as to picking up more than 10 pounds. Um, but I probably, my son would fall or he wanted to get out of the crib or putting him down was whiny and I probably cheated a few times and I was like, oops, I pushed a little too far, but not too bad. Um, I would say it felt kind of normal within two weeks. It was just the restrictions that, um, you know, they give you. But six weeks, I was completely cleared and good to go. You know, one thing that I've noticed in some of my friends and in myself is that just a day after the transplant, you have a different color. Did you notice that with Dan? Oh, it was instant. It was instant. 
I would say the best way to describe it is a miracle. It's literally a miracle. They, they take something out of you, they clean it out and they put it in him instantly. And all of a sudden, everything that's plagued him, everything that you get almost used to because it's such a, it's a slow process. All of a sudden it's, it's back. It's, it's there. And he's like, I look at pictures of myself 10 years ago and I don't look as good as I do now. And that was before he was in full failure. Mm -hmm. Um, the coloring, but yeah, it was instantly. And he felt better than me right after, but then he started to feel the, the surgery pain a few days and then I started to heal faster. So I felt worse after, but I healed faster than he did. Um, but he's a pusher himself. So, um, <laughs> you know, he is like back to work. I think on Tuesday, he came in for four hours of running his business and worked upstairs and was working. I think the day after his transplant, he was doing emails. So, oh, well, well, uh, he was working by that, email, right? I mean, I often do that, too, because I work from, you know, I work from home, I work with email, and it's so easy to be in the hospital and work. But you have to kind of balance it because you don't want to get too tired and run down and, and sick after you have a transplant. But you feel so good, too, because now you have a working filter that's gotten rid of all those um, impurities in your blood and your body. And it works pretty quickly. It's amazing how fast... Um, when I got my fourth transplant, my phosphorus was a little high before the transplant, and it was actually too low, like, the day after transplant. My ki- the the yes. kidney just worked so well getting rid of phosphorus, and all of those different minerals change your skin tone. People don't realize it till they actually see it firsthand like you have. So it, it's quite yeah, amazing it's pretty, what your kidneys easy. do when they work. Yeah, they said um, his creatinine, when he went in, it had stayed in a nine since that test, so um, other than when it went up high. So they couldn't really get it lower than a nine with dialysis. Um, first day, the day after, it was at a seven. And the day after that, it was at two. Um, it had actually... They said that a perfect kidney cuts it in half every day, and they said it actually did better than um, than perfect. Sounds like you have a super kidney because you're a super <laughs> advocate. I did. You're a super advocate, yeah. and um, Dan is doing well today. He is. He's doing really good. Um, he uh, feels better than he's felt in years. He's like, you know, you don't realize. You think that it's just age. Oh, this is just the fog that happens of things I don't remember, um, but. He's like, I now am like, oh, my gosh, it feels like you were in a fog. And all of a sudden, there's been a cleaning of your brain, it feels like. Um, and he's like, I can't describe it. It just feels like I felt when I was, like, 22. And then he's crazy. And then signs up. I'm like, I have a lot of energy. And he told me, I'm intense. It was, like, the list of things that were wrong were, I'm in kidney failure. I'm intense. I'm a workaholic. Take it or leave it was the second email. And I was like, oh, I'm intense, too. And I was like. Dude, you're exhausting me. What have I done? (laughs) I'm just giving you, like, I thought you were intense before, but I can handle it. And I'm like, you need to stop. You can't start another business. Like, can you take a break? (laughs) You both sound, was that one of the check boxes off um, in In Harmony? Are you overachievers or are you intense? Or did they figure that out with the personality test? Uh, Probably with the Myers-Briggs of extroverted and energy. Like, they ask, like, do you have a lot of energy? Do you people like do you, how much time downtime do you need? Um, do you jump into things? Yeah, you know, they ask you those kinds of questions. Um, the other thing to know is 20% of people they won't actually find matches for or take their money. So if they ask you, they ask you the same question in multiple different ways. And if they're not accurate and somebody's answering to what they think the test wants, they won't match you. So, um, you really need to take the test as uh, it being real. So they catch people, not all of them, I'm sure, but they can catch people that are just trying to say what people want to hear and it's not authentic. Oh, that's interesting. So, Lisa, can you, um, you know, give any advice for people who are thinking about donating a kidney? I can tell you that um, it is probably if there's 10 things in my life that I would make sure I did again, it's probably in the top two 
Um, other than meeting my husband, I guess that's probably my second one. Um, it was an amazing experience. It's surreal. Um, when you're laying there next to them and you're like, oh my gosh, my organ is in your body right now. That is so weird. Um, but it brought us closer, even though we were super close. I mean, there's now a bond there, um, that is undescribable that you can't really have in another different situation. Um, what they go through when they're going, if you love somebody or even if you just care about somebody else and you could match and you hear their story, what they go through of dialysis, um, of all the symptoms of running down their body and what you go through to fix it, um, the risk, they've perfected it at, at a point where it's basically the risk is if you're allergic to anesthesia, uh, anesthesia. Uh, to being put under, um, but you have a higher chance of being hit with a baseball in the head at a, a baseball game than you do from dying from from this, uh, from donating your kidney. The other thing is that it's about equal to having a really bad flu for two days of the pain, but they give you medication, so you get to sleep through most of it, um, <laughs> and then it's done, and um, it doesn't change your life other than don't take insides, but honestly, like your liver can handle, it regenerates, your kidneys do not. So if you have pain, you should be taking Tylenol anyway. Um, the other thing is you are now on the top of the list. If you ever were to go into kidney failure, they've screened you so well that the chances of it being that this was going to happen to you is slim to none. Um, also, your kidney grows. You now get all most of your function back. Um, they've tested to make sure. So the chances of this being the reason you go into kidney failure because you don't need it, that's not going to be it. It's going to be environmental. And if you were bit by a tick and got Lyme disease and went into kidney failure, you are now on the top of the list. That was going to happen to you. Um, so now you have a get out of kidney failure jail free card. Um, <laughs> you will get a kidney within two days. Um, I heard a story of this happening to somebody and she got a kidney in two days. Yep. Um, so you almost, like my husband says, the thing I should have done is 18 years old before my kidney scarred. I should have donated my kidney because I would have had a kidney in two days. The other <laughs> thing to know is that being a living donor, um, they take the kidney right from you into them. It's not put on ice. So it doesn't go to sleep. Um, when it goes to sleep, you're re- you're running the tread off the tires, basically, and that's the best way to describe a kidney. We're all our kidneys are all slowly dying. The tread, it's just are you running off road and running it ragged, or are you being more cautious? Um, they'll last longer. Well, and you're referring to a deceased donor, like a deceased donor kidney. They have to put the kidney on ice. Um, and I had uh, my third transplant, who was a deceased donor, uh, amazingly lasted 20 years. But uh, living oh, donor amazing. kidneys do last longer. And so, um, yeah. and, and, you know, to the surgeries plan, I mean, when you get called for a deceased donor kidney, you know, the transplant team's got to come together. You got to rush. You got to, you know, it's it's kind of like a fire drill. You're prepared, but you're never really prepared. And sometimes the transplants happen in the middle of the night. But when you have a living donor transplant, uh, the, the surgery is planned. Like, you know, the best teams there, the best transplant team with their nurses and you, OR staff. And it, it's just um, a, a, an easier environment to be transplanted. Although I did get a deceased donor kidney and it worked great. So I don't want to let anybody think that doesn't work just as well. But a, a living donor kidney is is a better option if you're able to get one. You should always take any kidney you can get. <laughs> exactly. Than dialysis. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> but, it's so true. Um, and you know, my friend donated to his sister in the '80s, and she um, he they had a history of high blood pressure. And they didn't really screen as much in the 80s like now they screen you. I've actually had somebody who was going to donate. They found some health issues that they didn't even know about. Um, And so donating might have saved their life. But uh, he he got a kidney, got on the list, um, and he he was transplanted within two weeks. So um, it's it's exactly um, you do go to the top of the list and it's a. Um, a little bit of protection. For sure. And um, 
you know, I think a lot of people I hear of like, uh, people that don't want, especially if they have diabetes or lupus or these things where they know that, you know, it's going to still be attacking it. Um, they don't want to put their child or anybody in that situation of that. What if I, they risk then I wasted their kidney and they feel guilty about it. And I will tell you this. If my husband was to have rejected my kidney right away and it was all for nothing, at least if he was to pass away from kidney failure, I would know that I did everything I possibly could do. And living with the what if would be worse to me than losing my kidney. Um, and it being, it wouldn't have felt like a waste because it would have given me that relief of at least I know I did everything I could and what happened happened. And you feel as if you're saving your your child or your sibling or a stranger or a friend from having to go through that loss of regret that could possibly happen. But you're also setting them up for what if. And I've talked to a lot of people that have told me who they've lost. I talked to somebody who said, I lost my brother. He wouldn't let me donate to him. And I live every day of, I wish I would have. Um, and so I think that's something to take into consideration of, people that have had people volunteer and don't want to put them through this. Trust me, I've, I've dealt with death and I've dealt with losing people. And if I knew that I did everything I possibly could, there's a relief in the grief process that doesn't last. And it's, that's harder to live with than not having a kidney. Well, Lisa, you are a true gem. I mean, it's obviously you met the love of your life and you're doing everything to save his life. Uh, to live the life you were meant to live with the man that you love. So um, thank you so much for being a guest on Kidney Talk and sharing your valuable wisdom and insight and courage. Thank you for having me. I just hope that, you know, maybe we can save a life or two. Um, and it's totally worth it. It's an amazing process. Yeah, it's painful, but there's nothing like it. And it was an amazing journey that I would take again in a second. Well, thank you so much, and have a great Valentine's Day. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.